So thank you, thank you, Marco, and all the people at Solid Docs for inviting me and inviting Golf and Golf Labor as very uh, as great hosts and also as um, collaborators in the action uh, that hopefully many of you will attempt tomorrow, which is why we're here. So I want to talk about two different strands. And as a member of Golf, who collaborates with, with these people you heard from, and we together produce this action on May Day, I want to talk about something inside of this image, which is that it's, um, it's like an opening up of a space inside a museum, and it's a, and it's a perspective on art, and somehow it also looks like Again, like somebody threw a lot of money onto the ground of the museum. So I'm interested in the connection between the museum um, and money in the form of debt on the figure of the artist. So, um, and more specifically, on how museum and debt are uh, forces of depoliticization in the neoliberal culture, how they function this way. Because I, my, I've, I'm part of two groups. One is Occupy Museums. They came directly out of the, out of the park, the Occupy Park in 2011, and, went, and that's what I bring to golf. And the other uh, work I'm involved in is called The Artist as Debtor, which is a kind of platform to better understand what effect debt has on the lives of artists and then to understand how, how that kind of personal political understanding widens into more communities and repoliticizes artists. So, in a way, museums seem to be, seem to be the public sphere, the way that, and, and, in the, and from a perspective uh, of an artist, they seem to be the, the kind of the long-term goal of one's career, looking not only to where you might show your work, but also to how, how you might be immortalized in history. And debt seems to be part of the private sphere in which you are alone, especially in the United States. We have, uh, you know, we have a giant problem of personal debt. So almost everybody is deep in debt. And this seems to be your own self-identity as somebody sinking into a financial um, kind of swamp. So here in Venice, in the context of the, the, so -called, the political Biennale, which is the 56th Biennale, which is perhaps political in content, but whose pavilions are largely funded by corporations and oligarchs whose yachts are parked alongside the exhibition, I want to talk about the economic frameworks uh, around the, creating, the creation of the meanings of art. Um, and I understand art as some in this in this context as something that's that's um, relies on be institutions to be created. So I want to look at these frameworks and analyze how they block political agency. Um, and this and then um, and what does it then mean to unblock the agency? For me, as an artist, I want to say it means an art practice. It means a different kind of art practice. In the practice that looks like a series of experiments, actions, occupied spaces, uninvited exhibitions, with risk attached, uh, which find, which are in search of, like crawler, like net crawlers, which are searching for real power and privilege, um, real beauty and ugliness, lines that meander and stray through real solidarities. And I mention this with some confidence, because I feel like right now, as a member of Gulf, we are existing inside of one of these lines of solidarity here in Solidox, having found co collaborators and a way to work together in a common cause. And this is precisely the art practice I'm talking about, which is the unblocked art practice. So Occupy Museums. Um, so you've heard of Occupy Wall Street. It started as a meme. The meme was Occupy Wall Street and people and, and Occupy the Bull of Wall Street. And people already hated Wall Street. 
because uh, because the banksters took people's money. But when when it was the meme was Occupy Museums, uh, the question was asked why Occupy Museums? Because people love museums. Why do you hate museums? Do you want, do you want to vandalize museums like the vandals once did all, right, all over Italy and mark on them and scratch the paintings? And even seasoned activist artists like Martha Rossler at the time, who some of you may know, even expressed concern that we would do harm to museums in a way that was not helpful because in the US there's a strong history of uh, actually we've completely lost our public funding of museums and artists and this is be partially because of kind of or, or it's, the story goes that it's because of some expressions and activism that took place in the 1980s and 90s during the culture war. So there was a lot of skepticism about Occupy Museums. But in fact, in the US, we are no longer fighting um, for more federal support. That battle has been lost. Uh, we, our system is almost 100% privately funded. So perhaps we live in your future. And our struggle is against an advanced use of art as neoliberal warfare. So, how much time? Okay, a few minutes. Okay, so, and just quickly, I, I've made many critiques that try to show, but museums function like a governmental ratings agency in their relationship to the art market. Unlike art fairs and auctions and art schools, museums relate, um, museums have a, a charge to exhibit art for the public. They, they exist in the domain of the public. And in doing so, they interpret meaning and form the canon, and therefore, they hold the symbolic power of making the value of art. And so, this puts the people behind the museums, you know, the people on the boards of the museums, in an amazing position to capitalize on the value of art. And this type of financial leverage runs parallel to the door, the revolving, as we say, the revolving door uh, between Wall Street and, um, and the government ratings. Uh, uh, they're supposed to be um, regulating Wall Street. It's a revolving door. So we have the same thing between the public and private, between the museum and the uh, auctions, for example. And museums, and to sort of pre-quote what Greg Chalette is gonna talk about, museums are also in their core um, task of exhibition, right? The expo, the exhibiting and making visible. They um, they make things visible, but we should be skeptical of this high level of visibility, because behind the visibility is the invisibility, which as which is the dark matter that Greg Chalet is talking about, which is a huge uh, you know collection of labor, which is unpaid and underpaid labor. And so for, when we were occupying museums, we took the, the General Assembly, the Assemblea, from Occupy Wall Street to MoMA. And, and eventually we, we went inside MoMA and we had discussions. And what, do, what did we talk about? We, sometimes we t even talked about the art. And we went inside a Diego Rivera exhibition. And and we read a quote that said, the aim of this appeal of 1931, Diego Rivera and Andre, uh, Diego Rivera and Andre Breton, the aim of this appeal is to find a common ground on which all revolutionary writers and artists may be reunited, the better to serve the revolution by their art and defend the liberty of that art against the usurpers of the revolution. And of course, in the exhibition MoMA, Diego Rivera is a name that's detached from these words and, and circulates in museums which are closely connected to auctions. So in occupying the museum, we are repossessing the meaning of the art, which is a tool to help us unblock you know, our political agency and go forward. And so it's a, I see it as a, a tool in, of of being able to create art. How much time do I have? It should be finished, but if you okay. want to go to a conclusion, okay. go for it. The artist as debtor. I, I'm only going to read a quote from that. Okay, that's, 
The artist as debtor seems to be personal. It seems to be, um, you know, it seems to be something in the U.S. especially that one should be embarrassed about to have personal debts to not speak about. And this is, the, I would say, the most effective block of political agency. Because all uh, artists that I study with and know, a certain circle of artists, are gazing up at the museums, trying, sort of hoping they'll be the one to get inside, and deep in debt, kind of slipping and not talking about it. And this is why, you know, basically, you can't do anything, right? So, Artists as Debtor is a platform to organize and to basically um, open up the, a discussion about um, about w where political agency may, may be. And beyond that, as Amin was alluding to, um, the danger is to become the victim because debt, uh, the, the people who are artists and have debt are often a privileged group of people, a mostly white privileged group of people. And, and I talked recently to a friend who, um, an African American friend who was gonna write something for the artist as debtor and she was critical of the platform. Because she said, slaves in the US were privileged to have debt because often people would buy their freedom. If, if you were lucky enough to buy your freedom, you would go into debt to buy your freedom. So it's a kind of dialectic where debt becomes uh, a privilege. So debt then is simply um, a understanding of your role inside uh, of a connective tissue and so in which we're all connected in which um, we can't go forward until we see who we are and how we are connected to it. Thank you.